Welcome to the COVID-19 Awareness for Food Safety Training. As a food service worker, you already know all about personal hygiene. Hand washing, cleaning and sanitizing, and cooking raw foods to a correct minimum temperature are all standard food service practices designed to keep people safe. These practices reduce the chance that you will infect a customer or coworker with an illness. Now more than ever, these principles can be applied to combat the spread of COVID-19. This course will teach you the best practices for controlling the spread of COVID-19, as well as how to recognize if you or someone else may be infected. Information cited in this course is primarily adapted from material published by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, and the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA. Relevant links to these government agencies and their promotional materials are provided in the description of this video. Let's get started. Course Agenda This course consists of four lessons. The lessons are Lesson 1 Introduction Lesson 2 What is COVID-19? Lesson 3 Preventing Transmission and Lesson 4 COVID-19 in Food Service. Lesson 1. Introduction. In this lesson, you'll learn more about Basics of COVID-19 Flattening the curve People at risk And your responsibilities as a food service worker. COVID-19. A global pandemic. COVID-19 is a disease caused by SARS-CoV-2, or novel coronavirus. This stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. The virus has quickly spread around the world, with cases reported on every continent apart from Antarctica. At the start of the pandemic, most local governments issued shelter-in-place or stay-at-home orders as a way to minimize the general population's exposure to the virus and flatten the curve. This refers to the graph that charts the number of new coronavirus cases each day once it is introduced into a community. While stay-at-home orders have all but disappeared, many local governments still encourage everyone to get vaccinated, wear masks, and practice social distancing whenever possible. These measures help to slow the spread of the virus, keeping the number of cases low enough that our health care providers do not become overburdened. However, these measures will not stop it altogether. That is why it is of the utmost importance that people who work in the service industry protect themselves from acquiring the virus and or transmitting the virus if they are infected. Johns Hopkins University's Center for Systems Science and Engineering, or CSSE, has provided a detailed map showing where COVID-19 cases are currently occurring, as well as the number of deaths and infections. A link to their website has been provided in the description of this video. Who is at risk? The truth is, everyone is potentially at risk for COVID-19. However, certain groups of people have a much higher chance of developing life-threatening complications due to the virus. Adults over the age of 65 and people with compromised immune systems carry the highest risk of becoming seriously ill from COVID-19. Multiple vaccines authorized by the FDA have been shown to be effective in preventing infection, as well as reducing the likelihood of serious illness in the event of an infection. If you are over the age of 65 or immunocompromised, it is a good idea to avoid large crowds in public places if you are unvaccinated. If you must go to work, you should take extra precautions to protect yourself or your customers. You should only perform duties that have minimal contact with other people, such as managing inventory rather than working the cash register. If at all possible, working remotely should be considered for workers at high risk for severe illness. Shared Responsibility since the pandemic was declared, the normal operation of many food establishments has been dramatically disrupted. Each state had different guidelines and requirements for when businesses were allowed to completely reopen. Regardless of where you live, you can count on things changing, 
maybe permanently, once the pandemic is completely over. You may find that more customers prefer to order takeout instead of dining in, or large celebrations may be held in a private location rather than a public one. Regardless of any changes that may come to pass, you share a responsibility with every other food service worker in America to minimize the risk of acquiring or spreading COVID-19. Likewise, it is up to your customers to cover their mouths and noses with a face covering and to avoid public places if they suspect that they may be infected. Purpose of this course This course is not required, but it is in your best interest to read these lessons carefully. Each of the following pages contains helpful advice on how to conduct yourself in a food establishment during the pandemic. Learning this information will not only protect you and your customers, but it will help the entire country in combating the spread of the virus. Please note, this course does Welcome not replace to your the safety training set course. by your state and local health authorities. This Always check with your local health department if you have any questions regarding COVID-19. Lesson 2. What is COVID-19? The virus. COVID-19 is the name of the disease that is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The virus is similar to the coronavirus that caused the SARS outbreak in China in the early 2000s, and both viruses are thought to originate from an animal, as many viruses similar to SARS-CoV-2 have been found in bats. Viruses are generally much smaller than bacteria, which makes them more difficult to detect. There are currently two types of approved tests for determining if someone is infected, viral tests and antibody tests. Each type has its benefits and drawbacks. Viral screenings are able to test for the genetic sequence of the virus and will give a positive result if it is detected. This kind of test requires a nasal swab or a saliva sample in order to verify infection. However, it is also possible to get a false positive using this method. Antibody screenings are able to detect the presence of antibodies in your blood that indicate if you do or don't have the virus or if you had it and are now recovering. The main problem with this test is that it takes time for your body to create antibodies in response to an infection, so you may not be able to determine if a person has the virus using this method if they were infected recently. Symptoms There have been many different symptoms reported that accompany COVID-19 diagnosis. They range from very mild to possible life-threatening conditions Symptoms typically start 2 to 14 days after infection. The CDC has released a list of the most common symptoms below. People with these symptoms may have COVID-19. Cough. Shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. Fever. Chills. Muscle pain. Sore throat. Or new loss of taste or smell. Children have similar symptoms to adults and generally have mild illness. This list is not all-inclusive. Other less common symptoms have been reported, including gastrointestinal symptoms like nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. When to seek medical help The CDC has provided a list of emergency warning signs for COVID-19. Trouble breathing, persistent pain or pressure in the chest, new confusion or inability to arouse, bluish lips or face. They have also compiled a checklist to determine if a person who was self-isolating because of COVID symptoms or diagnosis can end their isolation. If you have not had a test to determine if you are still contagious, you can leave home after these three things have happened. You have had no fever for at least 72 hours that is, three full days of no fever without the use of medicine that reduces fevers, and other symptoms have improved, for example, when your cough or shortness of breath have improved, and at least 10 days have passed since your symptoms first appeared. If you have had a test to determine if you are still contagious, you can leave home after these three things have happened. You no longer have a fever, without the use of medicine that reduces fevers, and other symptoms have improved, for example, when your cough or shortness of breath have improved, and 
you received two negative tests in a row, at least 24 hours apart. Your doctor will follow CDC guidelines. When to seek medical help continued. People who did not have COVID-19 symptoms but tested positive and have stayed home can leave home under the following conditions. If you have not had a test to determine if you are still contagious, you can leave home after these two things have happened. At least 10 days have passed since the date of your first positive test, and you continue to have no symptoms, no cough or shortness of breath, since the test. If you have had a test to determine if you are still contagious, you can leave home after you received two negative tests in a row, at least 24 hours apart. Your doctor will follow CDC guidelines. Note, if you develop symptoms, follow guidance on the previous page for people with COVID-19 symptoms. In all cases, follow the guidance of your doctor and local health department. The decision to stop home isolation should be made in consultation with your health care provider and state and local health departments. Some people, for example those with conditions that weaken their immune system, might continue to shed virus even after they recover. Transmission It may be possible for someone to become infected by touching a surface contaminated with the virus and then touching their eyes, nose, or mouth. However, it is thought to be transmitted primarily from person to person through breathing, coughing, or sneezing. The CDC has given guidance on the most common ways that it can spread. Between people who are in close contact with one another, within about six feet. Through respiratory droplets produced when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or talks. These droplets can land in the mouths or noses of people who are nearby or possibly be inhaled into the lungs. Some recent studies have suggested that COVID-19 may be spread by people who are not showing symptoms. Mechanism of Infection COVID-19 is thought to spread through aerosol droplets created when an infected person sneezes or coughs. This is in line with other common respiratory pathogens, like influenza, which causes the flu, and rhinoviruses, which are the most prevalent source of the common cold. Additionally, the SARS-CoV-2 virus appears to use the same receptor to gain access into a human cell as SARS-CoV, which is responsible for the SARS outbreak of 2002 to 2003 in China. Once inside the body, virus particles make their way to the lungs where they can replicate and destroy delicate lung tissue, as well as cause many other problems that are not covered in this course. Presented in the video description below, you will find a link to a poster made by the CDC highlighting the most important prevention techniques for stopping the spread of the virus. We recommend that you print out this poster, or something similar, to place around the establishment where you work. Sometimes, a little reminder can help us from performing an activity that may otherwise contribute to more infections. COVID-19 and Food as previously mentioned, the novel coronavirus is thought to be transmitted from person to person via aerosol or respiratory droplets. That is why anyone who is around other people, either at work or at the store, should wear something covering their face. The good news for food service employees is that there is not currently any evidence that COVID-19 is transmissible through food. That does not mean that you won't catch the virus at a food establishment, but we do not currently have evidence to support food being another source of the virus transmission. However, a person infected with the virus can still transmit it to others if they come to work when they are sick. It is a good idea to conduct health checks prior to starting work. This consists of checking your temperature and performing a self-diagnosis of any possible symptoms you may have. If you're not sure, don't risk it. Staying home when you are possibly infected is the best defense you have for stopping the spread of the disease. Social Distancing The idea behind social distancing is to maintain a distance of at least six feet between you and other people in public areas. Even if a person is contagious, 
social distancing will reduce the likelihood that they will infect someone else. This is especially important if your community is an infection hotspot because many of the confirmed cases so far did not show any outward symptoms. You can estimate six feet by stretching your arms out and measuring from fingertip to fingertip. Please note, this is a rough estimate and a measuring tape or tape measure should be used when placing social distancing markers on the floor. It is also a good idea not to attend gatherings of 10 people or more for the time being and avoid crowded places. The virus is most often transmitted when an infected person is in close proximity with an uninfected person. Food contact surfaces and utensils. Cleaning versus sanitizing. It takes more than soap and water to keep a food establishment clean and safe. It also takes chemicals and care to use them the right way. You want to be safe and you want to get the job done in a safe way for your customers. Both of these activities help to stop the spread of communicable disease. Cleaning. Cleaning removes dirt, debris, stains, and spills. Use hot water, detergent, scrubbing or wiping implements, and clean water for rinsing. Sanitizing. Sanitizing is the process of reducing the number of pathogens by using heat or chemicals on a clean surface. Dishes and equipment are sanitized to destroy any pathogens that may be present. To be effective, cleaning and sanitizing must be a three-step process. Surfaces must first be cleaned and rinsed before being sanitized. Sanitizing kills the bacteria and or viruses on a surface, either with very hot water or a chemical solution. The correct way to manually clean dishes and utensils is pre-scrape, wash, rinse, sanitize, and then air dry. Chemical Sanitizers Sanitizing reduces the number of disease-causing pathogens to acceptable public health levels, meaning a 99.999% reduction through the application of heat and or chemicals, chlorine, iodine, quaternary ammonium compounds, or quats, are all chemicals approved by the FDA for sanitization. Chemical sanitizers and hot water sanitization are the most commonly used methods for sanitization in the food service industry. However, each of these sanitizers is different with varying requirements for concentration, immersion time, pH, and temperature. For chlorine with a concentration of 25 to 49 parts per million, the immersion time is 10 seconds. The minimum solution temperature if the pH is 10 or less is 120 degrees Fahrenheit. If the pH is 8 or less, the sanitizing temperature is also 120 degrees Fahrenheit. For chlorine with a concentration of 50 to 99 parts per million, the immersion time is 7 seconds. The minimum solution temperature for a pH of 10 or less is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The minimum solution temperature for a pH of 8 or less is 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Chlorine with a concentration of 100 parts per million requires an immersion time of 10 seconds. The minimum solution temperature if the pH is 10 or less is 55 degrees Fahrenheit. The minimum solution temperature if the pH is 8 or less is also 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Iodine-based sanitizing solutions must have a minimum temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit and a concentration of 12.5 to 25 parts per million. Additionally, the pH of the solution must be 5 or less or no higher than the level that the manufacturer recommends. Quaternary ammonium-based sanitizing solutions must have a minimum temperature of 75 degrees Fahrenheit and be used only in water with 500 parts per million hardness or less. Concentrations for quaternary ammonium-based sanitizing solutions will be specified by the manufacturer's label. If immersion in hot water is used for sanitizing equipment or utensils, the temperature of the water must be at least 171 degrees Fahrenheit. Items that are sanitized by hot water must remain immersed for at least 30 seconds. 
If a detergent sanitizer is used to sanitize in a cleaning and sanitizing procedure where there is no rinse between washing and the sanitizing steps, the same agent applied in the sanitizing step will be the same agent used in the washing step. Food establishments using a two-compartment sink must use a detergent sanitizer or sanitize food contact surfaces using hot water. Proper hand washing. Your kitchen should have a hand washing sink with warm water, soap, and paper towels or a hand dryer. Make sure to always wash your hands at a hand washing sink and not at a food preparation sink. Bacteria and viruses reproduce easily under certain conditions, so think of your hands and fingernails as always contaminated. Just because they look clean does not mean that they are clean. The novel coronavirus can only be seen directly with the most sensitive microscopes. If you do not wash your hands in the right way, and if you do not keep your fingernails trimmed short, your hands can contaminate food, surfaces, clothes, and anything else that you may touch. Furthermore, never touch your eyes, nose, or mouth at work because you might end up infecting yourself with a transmissible disease. Single-use gloves can actually contribute to the spread of COVID-19 if used improperly. Wash your hands before putting on gloves and change gloves between tasks, such as switching from one type of food to another or taking money from different people at the cash register. If your gloves become torn or overly soiled, make sure to wash your hands before donning a new pair. Remember to always wash your hands. If the water is not hot or hand washing supplies are not available, tell your supervisor immediately. Proper hand washing steps. Soap and hot water will wash away germs. Wet your hands and forearms with warm running water and apply soap. Spend at least 20 seconds total time washing your hands. Rub your hands together, scrubbing your hands and forearms for a minimum of 10 to 15 seconds. Use a nail brush to clean thoroughly under your fingernails. Scrubbing your nails is necessary for your hands to be clean. Rinse your hands and forearms completely under warm running water. Dry your hands thoroughly with a single-use towel or an air dryer. Do not use a shared towel. If washing your hands in the restroom, use a clean paper towel to open the door if needed. Don't touch the door handle or you may recontaminate your hands. Then, wash your hands again in a hand washing sink outside of the bathroom before you start handling food. Do not use hand lotion. It may allow pathogens to grow. Lesson 4. COVID-19 in Food Service Introduction In this lesson, you'll learn more about Reopening Businesses CDC Recommendations for Restaurants and Bars Guidelines for Preventing the Spread of COVID-19 in Food Establishments And Your Role in Public Health Reopening Businesses Many restaurants and hotels were required to close their dining rooms to the public in an effort to slow the spread of the coronavirus. That is clearly not ideal for a business that depends on customers coming in to eat. Although many states have already relaxed restrictions, it is certainly not business as usual. Reduced seating occupancy and minimum required distance between customers are just some of the things that must be taken into account before restaurants can open their dining rooms again. Guidelines for Pickup and Delivery If your establishment is providing orders for pickup or delivery, there are a few precautions you should take to minimize the risk of infection. For deliveries, maintain food, time, and temperature controls. This is a standard practice that drastically reduces the possibility of foodborne illness. If possible, initiate no-touch deliveries and payments. The most common method is leaving the delivery on the customer's doorstep and having them pay electronically. Always wash your hands before you go out on a delivery and when you get back. You must still wear a face covering if you are delivering food. For pickup, minimize contact at checkout and pay stations. 
If possible, place a physical barrier between your deliveries area and the dining area. Encourage touchless payment, such as a credit card or app. Place social distancing markers on the floor to help your customers stay six feet apart from one another. As always, wash your hands before you go out on a delivery and when you get back. These guidelines are in addition to any policies your job may already have in place to handle deliveries and to-go orders. Safeguarding Public Health The nature of the food industry means that food workers will be coming into contact with multiple people each day, providing ample opportunity for an infected employee or customer to transmit the virus to others. Recognizing the symptoms of COVID-19 early is crucial to stemming the rate of infection and could end up saving lives. Make sure to follow regular cleaning and sanitizing procedures for food contact surfaces and utensils and increase the frequency that bathrooms are cleaned and disinfected. Additionally, clean and sanitize surfaces that are frequently touched by multiple people, like doorknobs, light switches, phones, and self-service areas. It is also a good idea to switch to single service items for condiments, salt and pepper, utensils, and menus. Don't hesitate to stay home from work if you feel sick and are displaying symptoms that could be attributed to COVID-19. The vast majority of people under the age of 65 do not have any serious complications that arise from COVID-19, but a healthy person who is infected could transmit the virus to someone over the age of 65 or someone with an underlying health condition. Conclusion These are unprecedented times for the United States and the world at large. We face a threat that has disrupted our way of life and our livelihoods. Furthermore, COVID-19 can have severe consequences for the old and the sick. While we now have three vaccines to protect against COVID, it will still be some time before the vaccine is distributed to a large enough percentage of the population to effectively curb the spread of the virus. With that in mind, it is our shared responsibility to safeguard the public health during these times. It is up to us to perform the duties of our jobs in a way that minimizes the risk of transmitting or acquiring COVID-19. After all, the topics discussed in this course all build towards a single goal, safety. Whether that refers to your safety, the safety of your customers, or the safety of our country, they are one and the same because we are all facing this crisis together. Some of these practices may seem excessive and could create more work for you at your job, but that is a price that must be paid to beat this virus. Remember, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure.